Alright. So <laughs> Ah, here we go. <laughs> um all right, so um this is one of the cool things about being a professor studying subcultures and and different stuff that I do. Um so this is uh Michael and I'm gonna I'm I'm may mispronounce your name because I'm a horrible person from the Midwest. <laughs> um Michael Tol Tolberg. Tolberg, yes. Um, and he is from LA, and um, I know him through my work on the electronic community through subculture, and so he has That's worked as a photographer for um, a really long time, uh, and taken some amazing photos that I use uh, in part of my work to help tell the story about um, the rave scene. And so he uh, recently spoke at. University of Southern California. Yes. Um, with a very well known uh, DJ known as uh, Christopher Lawrence, right? Um, and so he asked if he could come into class, and so I said, okay, sure, and uh, kind of tell us about the rave scene and the politics, his work as a, a photojournalist, and, um, you know, maybe try to tie in some of the stuff about uh, how the internet helped facilitate. This music subculture, which by all accounts um, started, emerged and became popular very quickly. Um, and I think part of that was due to the internet. But um, instead of me talking, I want to shut up now and let him have the floor. So thanks for being with us. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of background about myself um, to start with, just so you know who I am. Uh, my name is Michael Tolberg, and I'm one of the longest-running electronic music photojournalists in this country. Uh, I'm going on uh, year 26 now, uh, having started uh, in the rave scene in Southern California uh, in the mid-90s after uh, being thoroughly um, disenchanted with a lot of aspects of mainstream uh, club culture out here. Um, one of the reasons why I really enjoyed uh, the rave scene in the beginning was, well, there were a number of reasons. One was the much higher quality of music, and two, uh, it was the all-embracing um, philosophy of the rave scene. It was the complete opposite of what you might call the very elitist velvet rope, uh, preening, uh, you know, kind of mentality that you would find in a lot of LA clubs uh, at the time. Uh, they were based on the idea of being exclusive rather than inclusive. And the, the rave scene was very much the opposite. Um, there really were very few uh, criteria for becoming part of the rave scene. I mean, the main one was pretty much, you know, do you enjoy this music? The issues of, uh, you know, the, that you find in many other social scenes, such as uh, race and class and sexuality and all that, all that was pretty much thrown out the window. Uh, and I liked that a lot. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and there was also, of course, uh, the part of the whole thing where the fact that the rave scene was not 100%, you know, uh, legitimate in the mainstream also uh, was an attraction to me. Um, I liked the fact that, you know, I was experiencing you know pretty much the best dance music in the world uh you know and my friends in other social scenes uh had no idea you know what was going on with them um but uh it's uh the, the rave scene has been around for a long time and I, I still consider it to be around even though uh you know the whole the genre is now being dominated by edm festivals and all that um, there's always been a very important aspect of uh, this whole thing, and that's DIY, do it yourself. Uh, and in Los Angeles, that was because the mainstream clubs and venues and record companies and advertising people, none of them would touch electronic music with a 10 foot pole at the time. Uh, it's different now. Uh, but uh, the fact that the whole scene was, and the music and the artists in it were being so ignored at the time was what really gave rise to the whole DIY mentality in the rave scene, do it yourself. Very similar to what had happened earlier in uh, the emerging punk scenes and emerging hip hop scenes. Uh, because when you're on your own, you've got to become self-reliant. 
uh, whether in, in music or anything else for that matter. So uh, that is exactly what happened. Um, I mean, today's, you know, mega uh, promotion companies like Insomniac, back in those days, those guys were just, uh, you know, small competitors uh, in a very crowded field of promotion companies. I mean, Insomniac was slugging it out, you know, with a lot of other, you know, uh, companies uh, at the time, uh, most of which are not around anymore. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, if you want to talk about the history of electronic music in this country, uh, it basically, uh, it, it's not like a smooth, uninterrupted line graph that goes like this, you know, it, it, it really isn't like that, or wasn't rather. Um, instead, what happened is the series came in a series of waves, if you will, kind of like this, and uh, I'll describe those waves to you here. Um, the first wave was, um, it lasted roughly from about 1988 through 1994. Uh, this would be called the first wave, and this is really when the music, well, two things were happening at this point. One is that uh, the music was graduating out of the original Chicago and Detroit warehouse, uh, you know, scenes and stuff, and spreading into... Yeah. I just wanted to stop. Do you mind if I record this, actually? Absolutely. Please do. I was assuming that you were. <laughs> there we go. I'll send you a link, too. Please do. Okay, so anyway, let's, uh, let's start that off with the, uh, with the first wave again. Um, as I said, uh, the, the first wave of the rave scene lasted roughly from about 1988 through 94. Uh, this is when the music was graduating uh, out of the initial warehouse scenes in uh, Chicago and Detroit and other places, Chicago being a, mostly for house and Detroit being mostly for techno. Um, and simultaneously, the rave culture, which had been pretty much born and bred in England and Europe, was being transplanted over here. Um, it was coming in first in a trickle, and that trickle would eventually open up into a, a torrent, but that would not happen for a little while. Uh, this period, um, this is when the first, the, basically this is when the seeds of this whole thing were first being sown and the first initial early successes um, <clears throat> were being uh, achieved. By successes, what I mean is if you were a rave promoter uh, in these days, um, if you threw a party at that had anywhere from like 3,000 to 5,000 people, you were considered doing very well. Um, and again, that's because of the whole DIY thing born out of necessity, uh, because they were not getting any help, not from any major record labels, uh, no major uh, marketing or ad campaigns, you know, uh, major music magazines. Nobody wanted to touch, you know, the rave scene at this point. Um, so uh, anyway, yeah, like I said, this uh, went from about 88 through 94. And uh, oh, one of the other things that was happening uh, also is because even though, as I mentioned, the music had been born and raised basically initially here in Chicago and Detroit, uh, what happened was Southern, there was a shift happening that really accelerated into the second wave, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but basically what was happening is that the center of raving culture was moving west uh, out to Southern California. And there were several reasons for this. Um, excuse me. If you look at the history of music culture in this country, and I mean looking beyond electronic music, uh, you'll find a lot that uh, the two major centers have been mostly New York and Los Angeles for pretty obvious reasons. These are the two largest cities in the country, and these are the two largest music centers and also the two largest uh, mass media markets. So um, in New York, when this music first started coming over in the late 80s, the venue owners immediately understood what was going on with this music. I mean, they saw the reaction that, you know, the kids were having in the clubs and the club owners basically said, all right, this is new, this is hot, this is innovative, this is what the kids are going with, this is what we're going to go with. This did not happen in uh, Los Angeles. And when you look back, the, the um, reasons are pretty apparent. Uh, what it really comes down to is looking at the most popular forms of music uh, at the time, and those were in no particular order in 1988. Um, pop, of course, uh, rap, 
because it, most people were not referring it to as uh, hip hop at this point. And the third one, and this is the crucial one, was heavy metal. And in 1988, Los Angeles was the heavy metal capital of this planet. It was being uh, infested by a particular form called glam metal. Uh, you've seen this in uh, old music videos with groups like Poison and Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses, you know, and stuff like this. And the venue owners, you know, these guys were capitalists. These were not, they were not stupid. They saw what was going on and they was like, okay, this is what we're going to go with. We're going to milk this metal cash cow for all it was worth. Um, and as a result, the music was being frozen out. I mean, electronic music was being frozen out of the major clubs and venues. And the kids became very naturally became very frustrated by this as a result. And so after a while, some of them finally began saying, oh, okay, we're not gonna, you're not gonna let this mu our music into uh, your venues and your scene? Okay, no problem. We will build our own. And that's exactly what happened. Started small, as most of these things usually do. Um, and you had a lot of small, little, uh, and medium-sized uh, rave production companies that sprung up as a result. And uh, Insomniac, like I said, was one of them. There were others like CPU 101 and Go Ventures and B3 Candy and, and many others. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back to the first wave, the first wave uh, pretty much uh, expired at around 1994. And the reason for this is because there was a big police and media crackdown uh, on the scene, not just here in LA, but all over the place. Um, depending on where you were located in the country, that uh, crackdown lasted for about mm, a year and a half to two years, and it forced everything way back underground uh, as a result for a while. And after this, at about the end of 95, beginning of 96, this is the beginning of the second wave, which lasted from roughly 1996 through 2002. The second wave was when everything exploded across the country and uh, LA solidified its place as the center of raving culture in this country. And there were several reasons for this. Um, major ones being that uh, unlike other cities, especially in the Midwest, um, Los Angeles was not restricted to certain kind of venues. I mean, if you looked at Chicago and Detroit and, you know, lots of other places around the Midwest and, and even in the Northeast, um, what you had was a pretty limited amount of venues available. You had warehouses and you had some certain kind of clubs and not much else. LA did not have these restrictions because yes, we had the warehouses and we had the after hours clubs and all that, but we also had parties in the desert. We had parties in the mountains. We had parties on the beaches. It was pretty much anywhere where someone could stick a uh, sound system away from prying eyes. And um, as a result, um, you know, there were more and more parties being established and they became bigger and bigger. The other thing that was happening was that Los Angeles was getting more major talent, DJ and artist talent, coming through here on a regular basis. And crucially, a lot of those artists decided to stay. Um, these were people like uh, Paul Oakenfold, Christopher Lawrence, uh, DJ Rapp, uh, Donald Glaude, Dave Rapp. I mean, I, I could go on and on, but I think you get the idea. Um, and so, uh, as a result, we became very spoiled out here in Southern California because we didn't have to go all over the place uh, to find this quality music. It was being delivered right into our backyard, quite literally. And, um, and uh, one of the other things that began happening is that eventually this music started trickling into uh, commercials, video games, movie soundtracks, and stuff like this. Because as I said earlier, LA is a major media hub. Uh, you know, Hollywood is here. And so, and, and this was again, crucial because uh, there were a couple of clubs in LA, um, not many, but a couple that would allow rave quality music. And so some of these industry people started showing up at these clubs. And so, you know, about six months to a year later, you would start seeing, you know, this music popping up again in the commercials and marketing and all that. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, examples that I personally thought illustrated how this music had arrived was when I first saw the Crystal Methods music on Monday Night Football. 
uh, because you don't get more, you know, middle American than that. So, um, you know, it was, uh, and the second wave, as I said, lasted from about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 2006 to, I mean, sorry, 1996 to 2002. And then it plateaued for a few years, uh, once, at least in LA, mainly because the clubs realized that, oh my God, we can make money off this music. And I'm talking about the big clubs, the ones that would not let the music in before. And um, so that gave rise to uh, clubs like Giant here in LA. And the rave scene and the warehouse scene in particular became a little less necessary as a result because one of the reasons why these things had sprung up in the first place is, as I said earlier, the mainstream venues were shutting it out. Well, this was no longer the case. So, um, you know, as you know, it was easier for people to get to the music because it was in a nice central location, like a club. So uh, that was uh, what one of the things that causes, caused things to plateau for a while, for a few years. And uh, what was happening during this period is that some of the original ravers, you know, had uh, grown up and gotten married and have kids and mortgages and stuff. And so when you have all these things, you have less time devoted to partying, <laughs> of course. And so uh, some of the original rave generation was aging out and the beginning of the EDM generation was beginning to age in. And uh, this took a few years and it's uh, around 2006 or so when what you could describe as the third wave started. And we're still in the middle of the third wave. Uh, it could be called the EDM wave. Um, that's uh, oversimplifying it a bit, but that's basically what it is. And um, so, uh, yeah, and so this is when you started seeing uh, the rise of new kinds of sounds, particularly the Dutch sound uh, with people like Tiesto and Armin van Buren and Ferry Karsten, you know, and the like. Uh, you started seeing uh, more uh, breakbeats coming up and, um, and of course, uh, dubstep, uh, thanks to people like Skrillex and stuff. And then, you know, as the music started edging more and more towards mainstream pop, then that's when you had people like the Chainsmokers, you know, and, you know, lots of other people that I could describe. So uh, that's pretty much where we are right now, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, the music has spread across the country uh, pretty much on its own. Now the mainstream media is on board, but that, of course, is after it was demonstrated, like I said earlier, it's like, oh my God, we can make money off of this, <laughs> you know? So that's what it really comes down to. So that's a kind of general thing. I got a question maybe that, um, yeah. Okay, you know, what, so one of the things that I'm interested in is um, the politics yes. uh, of music subcultures and how they often emerge as a response to something. And so, you know, and, I go, I have arguments with people about this and we get thrown out of restaurants and stuff. <laughs> um, what, I mean, for those people who weren't around in those early days, and actually I wasn't a part of that early scene, I didn't come in until later. Um, how have the politics shifted and was Rave ever, ever political at all? Uh, not really. I mean, rave was a lot less political um, than a lot of other movements, unless you're talking about the inclusive factor, the inclusiveness factor that I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the things that I and a lot of people enjoyed about the rave scene, particularly back in the 90s, was the fact that it was not really political. Um, it, there was no, uh, you know, agenda like there were in, for example, uh, you know, the 60s, you know, hippie culture, you know, which is not only just peace, love and inclusiveness, but also, uh, you know, minority rights and the Vietnam War, you know, and all that. The rave scene never had any of that baggage attached to it. Um, excuse me. And I think that's what might have made it a bit confusing uh, to some mainstream people, because when you're looking at, um, you know, musical genres, especially when you're talking about ones like hip hop and stuff, I mean, there is necessarily a social and political agenda attached to those. Uh, but that wasn't really the case uh, with the rave scene. It was, the rave scene was really escapism in a sense uh, at its best. And, uh, and, and some of the music, well, a lot of the music was deliberately tailored toward that. I mean, Christopher Lawrence and I just uh, talk about this in my first book, Dance Floor Thunderstorm. Uh, 
one of the things that we thought was one of the strengths of a lot of uh, electronic music, particularly in the first and second waves, was the fact that a lot of these music didn't have vocals. Um, now, because vocals, I mean, they're great and they're wonderful and they can add great, you know, shades and textures to uh, music. But when you assign a vocalist to a track, they're going to bring a certain style to that track, whether that be soulful or whatever that. And when they do that, it tends to start categorizing things. It might not be, you know, that might not be the original intention, but that's what happens because people bring their past, you know, into, and I'm talking about artists here, people bring their past, you know, into the music that they're creating and stuff. And sometimes it ends up, you know, subcategorizing, you know, stuff like that when it wasn't meant to. Um, but as far as politics in the rave scene, I mean, yeah, it is pretty much the inclusiveness that was the main thing that could be construed as uh, being political, um, especially when considering that, you know, different kinds of music, you know, tend to, a lot of the times tend to, you know, shove out, you know, certain members of the audience. I mean, there's a lot of, like hip hop, for example, it took a long time for white middle America to catch on to hip hop. Um, long after, you know, people like Run DMC and Aerosmith had gotten together, you know, for tracks like Walk This Way or stuff like that. Um, there's still a lot of white uh, people in this country who just will not sign on with hip hop. Um, it's uh, partially for social reasons, partially for racial reasons. I mean, you have to talk to each individual, you know, about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the rave scene on the other hand was, um, you know, such an embracing thing by comparison. I mean, like I said earlier, that was one of the things that really drew me to it in the first place. Um, because I wanted, you know, in my social life, I mean, I wanted a wider variety, you know, of people in there. And um, it become, granted, it becomes easier in a place like Los Angeles, which is very, very multicultural. Um, you already have, you know, so many uh, different, you know, racial and social groups, you know, in the area. So um, assimilation like that becomes, uh, you know, a bit easier in that respect. So. I mean, yeah, and I, I think, so that's one thing I think that people should definitely take away from this, like, if you've never been a part of a, like, marginalized group, whether that be because of your music or because of your sexual orientation or your gender or anything, like the carving out of space, I think is, that is a kind of political act in a sense, right? Oh yeah, the, keep keep talking, I'm just adjusting something. Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I, you know, and that's the part that uh, people and I get into fights with about is about whether or not that's, that's political, and I kind of argue that yeah, it is, it, I mean, it can be depending on, you know, for instance, uh, you're in Missouri, right? If you start something up that's, you know, um, trying to carve out a space for different groups of people, that could be seen as political, right? Given the Absolutely. Of the area. So, um, well, do any of you have any questions for Michael? Because, right? I mean, even I can keep rapping because this is like, this is why I research, man. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what what do you guys want to know about the scene? You know, that was you know that was different back then from now. I mean, what? Uh, yeah, I can see a couple of hands there. So I'm curious about kind of like the delineation between yeah. like the rave scene and the music in the raves. I know that it, it's electronic music that was hosting like raves, but I know that what I understand to be kind of like options of electronic music, like uh, synth wave, retro wave, cyberpunk. Um, are those other categories of music? Th those, are, those are largely categories that are, yeah, like you said, offshoots. I mean, that was one of the things that the rave scene provided was the freedom to create offshoots like these. But the ones you're describing are pretty minor. And cyberpunk actually came around well before uh, the rave scene. Cyberpunk was very much an early 80s, you know, uh, thing. Uh, partly that came from uh, here. 
partly from Europe, partly from Japan. Um, I mean, if you really want to see some great examples of cyberpunk, you know, I mean, the movie Akira is the, the anime movie Akira is a wonderful example, you know, of that. But that's a whole other subject, you know. Um, uh, the music, well, the music and the scene were so tied together so tightly that it was, it's really difficult sometimes to separate electronic music from the scene. I mean, that would eventually happen once the thing expanded and began moving into more mainstream stuff. But, uh, but in the beginning, I mean, electronic, at least in this country, uh, electronic music and rave were mostly considered, you know, the same thing. And this is something that was very different than what happened initially, say, in England and Europe. I mean, in England and Europe, in the late 80s, beginning of what we would call the first wave, they immediately embraced, you know, this music to the point where, for a long time, America was really lagging behind the rest of the world uh, as far as uh, the development of electronic music and artists, you know, goes. Um, it was, uh, it took a while uh, for America to catch up. Now we pretty much have, and now the internet has made that partially possible. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it became, rave and electronic music became so inextricably linked that a lot of mainstream media began oversimplifying this and, uh, you know, and basically, uh, began trashing electronic music, the genre, and its fans because of its connection to what they saw as this dark, threatening, rave underground, you know, kind of thing. Um, that's partly out of politics, partly because uh, a lot of uh, news crews and uh, news stations and, and, and uh, programs and things like that, uh, they tend to gloss over a lot of uh, facts and stuff and try to put together stories that meet their particular agenda. In the case of a lot of this early uh, rave scene media coverage, it had a lot of it had very little to do with the music and much more to do with, you know, the almost scaremongering, scaremongering tactics of, you know, do you know where your children are, you know? <laughs> uh, Some of those clips actually um, from, you know, all these investigative reports. <laughs> quote unquote investigative yeah <laughs> actually so this is um this is actually a really good question that i get a lot um is so let me re just re, re uh, focus this just a little bit sure well, do you do you think that there was a unified <laughs> rave scene a lot of the british scholars tend to say that there was no unified rave scene. It was all a bunch of subgenres, and each each genre was kind of its own uh, subculture. And I have an issue with that because I think that it's I think they're trying to split hairs, but that's just my. Well, there's just I think there's a certain amount of truth to that, particularly when considering how different types of music uh, developed in different parts of the world. Uh, in the United States, you know, in the mid 80s into the late 80s, you had uh, the main kinds of music that were coming out of here, of course, were house and techno, as I said earlier. And each was very much, at least in the early days, its own thing. And the same, a very similar uh, situation happened in Europe uh, when you're talking about uh, music like trance and drum and bass, uh, because trance was very much, um, at least initially, very much a European, you know, thing. Uh, it would spread out everywhere, of course, but at the core and its initial um, tenets, if you will, uh, was European. Same thing with drum and bass, except that was very much a British thing. Um, because uh, America had never heard anything like drum and bass, you know, before. And uh, I mean... <clears throat> excuse me, even though quite a bit of it was just, <laughs> was just, um, you know, the um, <laughs> regular War Four stuff being sped up, you know, or taken into uh, different time signatures and stuff. Um, it, it's funny because uh, this reminds me of something that happened to, um, about four or five years ago. I was at a, a party at a warehouse and uh, they were playing drum and bass in there. And there were a couple of, uh, girls like early in their early 20s you know who were 
there just talking to each other and I happened to overhear what they were saying. And one of them turned to the other and said, this is the weirdest dubstep I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> And I was going to myself, oh, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> Which shows, I guess, you know, the state of, you know, musical education <laughs> about this music, you know, because, you know, drum and bass, I mean, it's so, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, American dubstep is you're taking most of, of drum and bass and reducing it to a, you know, 4-4 four, four sound. And, of course, throwing in the wah ba 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 you know, and all that. So, um, yeah, so there is, a, there is a certain amount of truth to uh, the subgenres uh, evolving independently. On the other hand, there is very much also the overall kind of rave umbrella, uh, which holds this whole thing together, because, the, you know, there are certain things that uh, are the same, and I'm talking about socially and stuff, not, not in musical terms. Uh, but in socially, there are certain things uh, that have remained the same, one of which is um, the great, uh, you know, old acronym PLUR, uh, Peace, Love, Unity, Respect, which was coined um, by my old friend Frankie Bones, you know, in New York. Uh, if you guys don't know who Frankie Bones is, I would highly suggest you educate yourself and find out because this guy was uh, not only a uh, techno pioneer, but he was also one of the guys who was directly responsible for helping transplant British rave culture into America. Uh, one of the key things he, ways he did this was uh, through his uh, storm raves uh, in 1991 and 92. Uh, these were warehouse parties uh, in New York um, that uh, were the first to really capitalize on that whole rave oh, well I, what's the word i'm sorry i'm having a brain fart here but uh it's uh the, the uh the whole the whole thing it didn't only start with the storm raves that was only one example but um but it shows how the music as it trickles you know across like that um across states across countries across continents um it shows what a unifying thing it can be. And like I said, one of the reasons for that is the fact that they threw so many of the uh, uh, old social and cultural barriers out of the window. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you, you answered that actually, because, um, so I haven't told you this, but I just got to revise and resubmit on the article, the journal article I was working on, and that was basically one of the main um, uh, critiques that they wanted me to answer. So I've been like racking my brain on how I answer this. So you, you've given me some creative uh, energy to. Um, <laughs> well help <laughs> okay. Any other questions back there? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so is there the same, like, I know at least in hip hop, and especially you talked about like the aging out aspect, is there the same generational gap in electronic music where kind of older generations don't like the newer generation of music? Like yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people, in, I mean, I'm 51, and a lot of people in my generations just do not uh, go for EDM at all. Uh, there are a lot of people who used to go to EDC back, you know, in the day, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and they won't go now because uh, they don't want to see Skrillex. They don't want to see the chain smokers. You know, they want to see people like uh, Carl Cox or, you know, the Crystal Method or Prodigy, you know, so well, you can't see Prodigy anymore, sadly. Um, but uh, yeah, there is very much a gener generational thing. Now, part of this is a natural thing because you get generational, you know, separation in all sorts of music, as you pointed out earlier. Um, yeah, because a lot of people today, you know, who are, you know, so big on, you know, on Cardi B or whatever, they have no idea who Run DMC was, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so yes, there is a, a certain generational separation, uh, you know, to that. Um, I do wish that uh, more, that there would be more intergenerational mixing, and and granted this is part of my old fart status, but uh, I really do wish that um, a lot uh, more EDM kids would start listening to older stuff uh, from the 90s and from the early 2000s, um, if for no other reason to get away from 
just uh, having the music based, being based solely or almost solely on the drop. Um, I, we talked about this, me and Christopher Lawrence talked about this uh, at our USC thing a few weeks ago. Um, because I, I read somewhere, and I don't know this, if this is true or not, but it sounds true, uh, that uh, apparently in the EDM, or in most cases of EDM, the quote-unquote ideal uh, time for, you know, releasing a drop is like once every six minutes or so. And that was definitely not the case in most cases um, in, the, uh, in the rave scene in the 90s and 2000s, uh, where you would have one or two drops in an hour. Uh, you know, the, the music was much more of a long-term investing your time and your feet and your head, you know, uh, into those long explorations of music and the different layers of music that uh, DJs, the best DJs, would layer over, you know, the basic tracks and the basic sounds. Uh, especially when you had people like Carl Cox, you know, who invented uh, the three turntable setup, you know, which takes, I mean, you've got to be really ambidextrous to do that, you know, not just to be able to operate three turntables at one time, but to actually keep those sep those sounds separated and yet mixing together and stuff. And people would pick up on that. Um, and, and I won't kid you, one of the things that enables people to do that uh, is MDMA. Um, that, I mean, to, to suggest that it, it wasn't part you know, of the whole equation would be disingenuous. I mean, it was. And um, MDMA has the ability to, for, it, it enables people to really, really hyper-focus on the sounds that are going through their heads. So much to the point that sometimes you're like almost analyzing it live as it's happening, as it's going through your head. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, yeah, so that that was a factor. I mean, it's uh, I'm not going to pretend, you know, that it wasn't, but, um, you know, it uh, it was and, you know, and still is. But it's uh, it, it's a bit different now. But uh, it's uh, I mean, th but that could be a, a whole entire discussion for another class, <laughs> to be honest. Um, any other questions there? Yeah. Yes. Um, how do you think the culture surrounding electronic music will like continue to evolve or change? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Could you be a little louder? His question was, how do you think it's going to evolve and change? So, like, what's the prediction for the next ten years or so? Yeah, that's specifically like the culture surrounding. So the culture, like, how's the culture going to change? You think? Uh, that's a very good question because a lot of people were thinking that this third wave of the EDM, uh, I mean, this third wave, this EDM wave, was going to peak out, you know, a few years ago, and it clearly hasn't. Um, what's happening now with culture is, like I said earlier, it's becoming more and more integrated with the mainstream. I mean, if you really want to see a great example of this, well, not a great example, but a prominent example, I mean, uh, is uh, look at the island of Ibiza. Uh, Ibiza now is not the same thing as it was, um, you know, I mean, you guys all know what Ibiza is, right? You know, the island? I do. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll get, okay. Ibiza is an island off the coast of Spain, which has been a party destination for electronic music fans for like the last 30 years and for other forms of music well before then. I mean, Freddie Mercury used to party on this place. So, I mean, a lot of uh, Mick Jagger used to go there a lot. Jimmy Page used to go there. A lot of, uh, you know, high-end musicians used to go there. And um, so it became um, a massive uh electronic music center starting uh, in the 80s. And um, when you went to Ibiza, the idea was that, you know, it was like, sort of like Burning Man became. I mean, it was like a getaway from everything, you know, and just so you could completely immerse yourself uh, in that culture and in that music, you know, and stuff. And uh, like a lot of other uh, places around the world, uh, Ibiza has become it, it, more gentrified. Uh, there have been more, you know, hotel, luxury hotels that have been going up there. Uh, and uh, so it's become much more corporate, more commercialized. And a lot of people think that uh, the original atmosphere in there was, uh, is lost or is being lost. Um, you can see more examples of this corporate corporatization, if you will. Um, well, a really great example are the super clubs in Las Vegas. Um, the, yeah. 
which just lost money. This was their first year they lost money. Yes, this is, yeah. This, and so it's a good question about what's going to happen to these clubs now um, because, uh, well, I mean, Las Vegas, I mean, they don't, quite honestly, they don't, they don't give a damn about club culture. They just care about uh, the money. That's what Vegas has always been about. I mean, this is why, you know, you, they got people like, you know, uh, Avicii and Tiesto and stuff and paying them, you know, $400,000 a night, which is ridiculous, you know, because, but these in Vegas, they're not going towards the regular rave crowd. They're going for, you know, the uh, bro culture crowd, the ones, uh, you know, that are getting bottle service all the time, the ones that are dropping five or 10 grand a night, you know, uh, in, uh, in the, the casinos, you know, and stuff. so, uh, uh, so it's the fact that some of these clubs are now, you know, kind of petering out. I, I personally think that's a pretty good thing. But of course, that's because I'm a traditionalist. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think you're going to see more uh, electronic music showing up in more uh, TV shows, more video games and stuff. It, it, it's just part of the whole trend of assimilating this into more of the mainstream and away from the underground. Uh, that's not to say that the underground isn't around. It most definitely is. Um, I mean, I still go to warehouse parties, you know, here in LA at least once a month uh, because it's not the clubs. It's not the velvet rope mentality. It's not, you know, the elitist preening Hollywood promoter BS, you know, that is so prevalent, you know, in this city. I mean, I really like being able to go into a bare room, which only has a few lights and a pair of turntables and about 500 people in there because I know I'm going to hear something that I didn't hear yesterday, you know? And uh, I mean, that's what's really at the core of the underground uh, is, is finding those new sounds, finding those new directions, you know, doing things that, you know, nine out of 10 people aren't doing. I mean, that's, if you guys have any sort of underground, you know, scene in Missouri, and I have no idea if you do or not, but if you do, I really hope that you decide to explore it uh, because you're going to find things in there that you're not going to find, you know, in the mainstream clubs, musically and socially. So um, anyway, anyone else? Yeah. Um, how do you think social media or journalism has impacted the racing and people's perceptions? It's impacted it greatly, um, along with everything else, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, every other, you know, social aspect outside the rave scene. Uh, yes, it has changed things a great deal. Uh, one of the, I'll give you one, a really big example. One of the th ways that, uh, well, the main way that uh, parties used to be promoted, in fact, I'm going to show you something here. Um, one of the things that the parties, the main ways that parties were promoted back in those days were through rave flyers. And yeah. you would, yes, and you would find these things in underground record stores and head shops, you know, and things like that. And um, they would uh, have, you know, all the artists, you know, listed on there and uh, what you would see. I'm gonna hold this up to the camera here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, part of these things is you could see all these info lines that would be on these, um, these phone lines that would be on these flyers. And what you would do is, um, since there was no internet, you know, back then, or no, no web anyway, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you would go to these re uh, record stores, pick up the flyers and call up the info line and they would say, you, you know, this party is happening on this date and this time, you know, and then a few hours before the party was set to start, they would change the messages on those phone lines and they would update them with locations of, you know, or if not the location of uh, the actual gig, they would give the location of the map point. And the map point was a place that you would go to get directions to the actual gig. It was like a scavenger hunt thing. And it, the, the main reason for this was to throw off law enforcement, to be honest. Um, but um, so, so uh, you know, it was a very analog system and it, it has, a, there were a lot of links in the chain, you know, so to speak and stuff. And, uh, and that was one of the things that really um, showed you if you were a real fan of this uh, music and scene, if you were willing to go through all those extra steps, you know, to get to this place. Uh, Cause like I said, it was like a scavenger hunt. And so if you managed to get to the end, there would be great rewards, you know. Um, nowadays, it's very different because, of course, uh, with social media and the internet, everything is served up 
like that. You know, it is so much easier uh, to get to uh, parties, to find better music, um, uh, to find the kind of music that you're into, you know, or what have you. It's just, it's so much easier. I mean, the, I was talking about the warehouse parties here in LA a few, a few minutes ago. Uh, the way that they do this, they don't have rate flyers anymore. Uh, they do it all on social media. Um, they not only put up, you know, the digital equivalent of rate flyers on there, but they also do screening of their audiences on there. So online, so as to keep, you know, the douchebags and the bottle service people out, you know, um, I mean, they, because uh, like, for example, one of them um, is a company called Incognito and they have a multi-step online verification process that they use. Uh, because they've realized that the douchebags who want bottle service don't have the patience to go and jump through all those hoops, you know. Um, and when they actually do start, uh, you know, approving people for the parties, um, sometimes, I mean, they will screen those people online and see what they're up to in it, on their uh, social media behavior. And if they find out, you know, that you're out there talking shit, you know, about people or whatever or something, you know, you won't get the data to get you to the party. So, um, so it has changed. It's, uh, in some ways it's become a lot easier. Um, um, but in other ways it's, um, well, it, the, the book hasn't been fully written on this yet. I mean, I, you're going to start. Working on it. I'm working on it. Uh -huh. I said, I'm working on that book. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, the the internet has has changed so much, you know, about that. Um, it's uh, I mean, now I mean, Christ! I mean, the, when you see festivals like EDC and stuff, not only do they uh, do their pre promotion, but they do post promotion. You know, they you know they put on their you know post uh, wrap up films, you know, and stuff like that. And so uh, so that's changed, you know, things a bit too. And the other major thing now, of course, is that the uh, the music industry has finally woken up, you know, to this. And so part of that was when you had uh, EDM artists uh, like the Chainsmokers and Skrillex and stuff doing, uh, you know, crossover stuff uh, with mainstream artists, uh, which is now, you know, very, very popular. Um, it wasn't the case back in the 90s. I mean, it was to give you some idea of how breakthrough the music was back then. I mean, Paul Oakenfold, who I'm, do you guys know who Paul Oakenfold is? Okay. Paul Oakenfold is one of the longest running uh, electronic music DJs in the world. He's been the biggest DJ and producer in the world many times, you know, over the years. And uh, he couldn't get arrested out of the rave scene until uh, he started becoming famous by opening up for Madonna, you know, on tour. Um, you know, and I'm sure there were a lot of people, you know, the, of Madonna's fans who initially were going, oh, God, who's this guy just spinning records? You know, can't, you know, why doesn't she get a band? You know, whatever. Um, that was until they started listening to what he was spinning. And, um, yeah, if you get the chance to see Paul, uh, yeah, by all means do so. I mean, he's, a, he's an old friend of mine and uh, he's a good guy. And uh, he's one, he's, he's a really important guy because he's one of those guys who, who was uh, part of the bridge from the original uh, rave, uh, you know, Summer of Love in England in 88 and 89. People like him and Carl Cox and Fatboy Slim, you know, stuff. Yeah, that's kind of an important point too, you know, in that early wave and even in that second wave, these rave companies help screen out what was not authentic music, you know? Yeah. And so, like a lot of times you'd go to these shows and you wouldn't know who was playing. You just, okay, you paid your cover, whatever, if there was a cover. And uh, you just enjoyed the music. So like the, the guy or, or person rather, um, performing, you know, you may not know who the hell they even are. Um, I think that's like a really, key point about how social media has changed the game don't you think mm, yeah no you're right it has <clears throat> excuse me um any other questions yes so we we talk a lot about subcultures and their relationships with different demographics in our class and i was wondering what your thoughts 
are on like the like the rave scene both historically and currently and how open or accessible it is to women people of color and queer people well as i said before you know the rave scene differentiated itself and i'm talking about during the first and second waves here the rave scene differentiated itself from mainstream uh, pop culture by its inclusiveness, as, uh, particularly towards women and minor minorities and LGBTQ, you know, and all that. Uh, because as I said earlier, I mean, those barriers were pretty meaningless um, when your main criteria was, you know, do you like the music or not? Uh, and that has pretty much accelerated now. I mean, it's in, if you go to an EDM festival, I mean, you're going to find, you know, everything, everybody, you know, there uh, in terms of uh, social groups and, and uh, stuff like that. So, um, I mean, I, I'd like to think that this is a very positive thing that the, the rave scene introduced, you know, to mainstream pop culture. I mean, this, you know, even movements, you know, like, you know, the 60s rock culture and stuff. I mean, it, they were trying to get as many people in as possible. But as I said earlier, the political agenda also had a tendency to alienate, you know, uh, certain, you know, aspects of American society. I mean, you know, it was no accident, you know, that uh, a lot of people in the, you know, former Confederate states, you know, were, were the ones who were most anti, you know, um, hippie, you know, culture and stuff because it was so diametrically opposed to the, you know, that uh, Midwestern social and political, you know, agenda, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, very, um, well, I'm gonna oversimplify here, but very white Christian, you know, uh, thing. Let's put it that way. I mean, you, again, this is another subject you could go into for a long time, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that's one very positive thing that uh, that the rave scene has offered is the fact that it's brought all these different social groups together uh, and largely avoided uh, a lot of uh, inter-social and intercultural friction. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's a pretty good way to sum it up, I think. Um, anyone else? We have time for one more. Um, gosh, and all three of you raise your hands at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, uh, go ahead. Um, in terms of music, would you say it's a male-dominated industry, or is there like a new wave of female artists coming in, like hip hop? It still is very much a male-dominated industry, and that is a shame. This is a, an old issue uh, with this. Uh, with this, um, I mean, it was back in the '90s. I mean if you got, went through the different uh, magazines of the day, like Herb and, or Mixer or BPM Culture, because that's what we had. We didn't have the internet to instantly, you know, send off social media messaging and stuff. It was, it was uh, you know, analog. It was print media. Uh, yes, this issue was uh, very much being lamented in the magazines, you know, back then, uh, because unfortunately it's, mm, I would say about one in 10 or maybe one in eight, um, you know, high quality artists that are in the industry uh, only, you know, are female and, and that's a shame. And um, which is why you have a, people like, uh, for example, uh, DJ Colette and DJ Heather, who are old friends of mine, uh, these two tour together constantly and stuff uh, to kind of, you know, bump up that, you know, pro-female, you know, kind of uh, vibe or agenda or you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, yeah, and that's been basically born out of necessity. Now, the fact that there have been more EDM artists who have been doing crossover stuff with mainstream people, uh, and I'm thinking of people like Alice in Wonderland and Halsey, you know, and stuff like that, um, that, that is encouraging. Uh, the fact that, you know, the, you have the uh, mainstream spotlight on this issue um, will hopefully, you know, serve as a sort of correction, you know, to this thing, but it's, it's going to take a while, you know, unfortunately, I, I wish it were different. I really do. Um, because there are so many female DJs that I've known over the years who've had to get out, uh, because they did not have a future, you know, for themselves, uh, in it, uh, because, you know, to get a record company or whoever, 
uh, behind a female artist is much harder to get them behind someone like Skrillex or Paul Oakenfold or Carl Cox or the Chainsmokers or, or you know, whoever. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Michael, so much. Um, it's been really quite a pleasure. It's been and, my pleasure. Um, you know, and I'm, I'll definitely be in touch, but uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks again. All right.